Happy Saturday, everyone. Today is the first Saturday in May, which typically would be Kentucky Derby Day. But the Derby has been postponed until September 5th of this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we thought today might be a good day to re-release our previous episode on the Kentucky Derby's first 50 years. This episode originally came out May 3rd, 2017. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Lately, one of the projects I've been working on for our podcast is a huge This Day in History calendar of all of our past shows. Uh... And an unexpected side effect of this is that I keep adding people and events to the my short list of things to talk about as I stumble upon things that happened on a particular day. Uh, one of those tidbits is that on May 3rd, 1952, that was the first time the Kentucky Derby was nationally televised. That piece of knowledge sent me down a Kentucky Derby rabbit hole, and that has brought us to today's episode Although horse racing in general has been around much longer than the Kentucky Derby has, including in the United States, the Derby itself has become the nation's most famous and prestigious horse race event. And sort of like Super Bowl Sunday, in some circles, the first Saturday in May has become a huge production, even among people who don't normally pay attention to horse racing at all for the rest of the year. More than 160,000 people watched the Derby in person at Churchill Downs in 2016, with more than 15 million watching it on the TV. Uh, Our past hosts, Sarah and Dublina, talked just a little bit about the overall Kentucky Derby history in their 2011 episode on jockey Jimmy Winkfield. So today we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail. And the Saturday after this podcast comes out, the Kentucky Derby is going to be run for the 143rd time. That is way too much history for 30 minutes. So what we're really... (laughs) What we're really going to focus on is the race's first 50 years, uh, which really established the things that have become the cultural hallmarks about it today. Horse racing, of course, is one of mankind's oldest sports. It's been around for so long that we actually can't conclusively pinpoint its origins. But chariot races and races of mounted riders were both part of the Olympic Games in ancient Greece. In Europe, Asia, and Northern Africa, cultures that have valued horses and horsemanship have all had their own horse racing traditions going back thousands of years. In the Americas, horses became extinct somewhere between 8,000 and 12,000 years ago. But when Europeans reintroduced horses in the 15th century, indigenous peoples, particularly in the plains, developed their own racing traditions. The existence of horse racing has also led to the development of racing specific breeds of horses. One of those breeds is the thoroughbred, which originated in England. Thoroughbreds can be traced back to three stallions known as the foundation sires. These were imported into England in the 17th century and are known as the Darley Arabian, the Godolphin Arabian, and the Byerly Turk. Once the thoroughbred breed was established, Races specifically for thoroughbreds followed. Traditionally, a derby is a race for three-year-old thoroughbreds, open to both colts and fillies. Whether gelded horses are eligible can actually vary. The first derby was named for its host, the 12th Earl of Derby, and was run at Epsom in Surrey, England, in 1780. The Epsom Oaks, open only to fillies, actually started the year prior, and it was named for the Earl's nearby estate. As a side note, we do know that the race is pronounced Darby in Britain. We are not in Britain. It is pronounced Derby here. But now I will think of the Kentucky Derby as the Kentucky Derby, and it will crack me up every time. Consistently. Oh, yeah. So because of this connection to the aristocracy and all of the expense involved with owning and caring for a racehorse and the often lavish celebrations that run alongside prestigious horse racing... Racing horses has become known as the sport of kings. Although according to the Oxford Dictionary, hunting, surfing, and warfare are all also the sport of kings. I suspect there's some bias there depending on which sport you participate in. Yep. (laughs) By the end of the 1700s, the race at Epsom definitely was not just for kings, though. It had become a sprawling social event known as the Londoner's Day Out, which attracted both the aristocracy and the working class. 
tens of thousands of people attended every year, some of them ditching work to do so. Although the race itself was a prestigious sporting event, many of the attendees were more interested in gambling and carousing than in the race itself. And the gambling wasn't just on the outcome of the race. Tents popped up all along the downs where people lay wagers on cards and dice. It was his experience at Epsom that inspired Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr. to start a similar race in the United States. Clark was the grandson of William Clark, who explored North America in the Corps of Discovery with Meriwether Lewis. Clark, who was then 26 and newly married, traveled around Europe with his wife in 1872 and 1873. On this trip, he went to the, at this point, incredibly well-established races at Epsom and elsewhere, and he made friends with members of jockey clubs all around England and France. So when Clark got back to the United States, he set to work trying to found a derby near his family home in Louisville, Kentucky. Horse racing was already an established pastime in the United States in general, and in Kentucky specifically. In Louisville, the horse racing industry had started with races down Market Street, at least as far back as 1789. As horse races on city streets became a problem, tracks were built to accommodate those races. Commercial horse breeding was already part of the Louisville area and Kentucky as a whole, although the track that had been hosting the thoroughbred races had closed down in the years prior to Clark's trip abroad. First, Clark needed a place to start a track, and he got this from his uncles, John and Henry Churchill, who leased him the land that would later become known as Churchill Downs. But the land by itself was not enough. He also needed enough money to fund the construction of an actual racetrack, a grandstand, and the like, and this came from selling subscription memberships. 320 of them for the price of $100 each. This was enough to let him build six stables, the clubhouse, the grandstand, and the porter's lodge. All this became home to the Louisville Jockey Club and Driving Park, which held its first Kentucky Derby on May 17, 1875, with four races being run that day. Three continued to be an annual tradition. The Kentucky Derby run on the first Saturday in May, the Kentucky Oaks run the day before, and the Clark Handicap run in November or December. In that first Kentucky Derby, 15 three-year-old thoroughbreds, 13 colts, and two fillies ran a mile and a half, or roughly 2.4 kilometers, in front of a crowd of about 10,000 people. People of means were in the clubhouse or the grandstand, and the race and the racetrack's infield was open to anyone who wanted to come for free. That very first race set a lot of the standards that the Kentucky Derby is still known for today, and we're going to talk about those after we first pause for a little sponsor break. <laughs> The idea that Derby Day was something special and specific to Kentucky was present right from the very first one. On May 17, 1875, the Louisville Courier-Journal proclaimed, quote, Today will be historic in Kentucky annals as the first Derby Day of what promises to be a long series of annual turf festivities of which we confidently expect our grandchildren a hundred years hence to celebrate in glorious rejoicings. So they get points for accuracy of prediction. That was right. (laughs) Uh, The infield had a lot of the same day-out atmosphere Clark had seen at Epsom, and it attracted an array of locals from various walks of life. But in the grandstand and clubhouse, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr. wanted the event to be a classy and prestigious affair, so full morning dress was required, and the ladies were encouraged to attend, although they were barred from the bedding shed because it was an unsuitable place for them. That means that the hats that have become a derby tradition were there from the very beginning for the sake of propriety, fashion, and the very practical protection from the sun. Although it would be a while before Kentucky Derby hats took the more extravagant turn that they have today, that really came along with the loosening of social expectations in the 1960s, and then it got a further boost with the 2011 royal wedding that seems to have set off some hat one-upping of trying to have more strange and unique hat than the ones at the royal wedding. Clark's effort to class up the place applied on the racetrack as well. Sport of kings or no, racetracks often had seedy reputations and connections to sometimes dishonest gamblers. Clark, on the other hand, was scrupulously attentive to the rules, and he had no tolerance at all for cheating, dishonesty, poor sportsmanship, or gamblers' attempts to rig the race. 
He would not abide anything that seemed shabby or underhanded. And there were people who personally didn't like him. He was known to have a temper, and some people found him arrogant and ostentatious. But even people who didn't get along with him would vouch for his unfailing integrity when it came to the race. Within a decade, the Kentucky Derby had built a solid reputation as both a race and a social event, earning praise in the New York Times and attracting huge crowds of spectators who weren't necessarily interested in racing in their everyday lives. It still had that divide of an everyman experience in the infield and an upper-class one in the grandstand and especially the clubhouse. But after a strong start, though, the Derby's success started to wane a bit in the late 1880s. Angry disputes over betting led some of the industry's most prominent owners to take their horses elsewhere while also damaging the race's reputation. Reform movements were trying to put a stop to racing, gambling, and drinking. And the Kentucky Derby was also competing with newly launched derbies elsewhere in the United States, including the American Derby in Chicago. By the middle of the 1890s, the Kentucky Derby was really struggling. Other races were offering bigger purses, and that made it hard to attract the best horses and the most prominent owners. The lack of interest trickled down to the race course, falling into some disrepair. The Derby did manage to keep going as a social event, especially among locals, but as a race, it just wasn't breaking even or carrying the level of prestige that Clark really wanted. In 1894, the Louisville Jockey Club, which was by then deeply in debt, was sold to new owners. While the prior owners had been focused on putting on a good race for its own sake, the new owners were mainly businessmen and bookies, and their focus was to make sure that the race made money. They were able to pay off all of the club's creditors except for one, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr., who they convinced to stay on board as the race's presiding judge. And this was a strategic PR move. Horse racing, and especially gambling, were under increasing social scrutiny, so they were banking on Clark's stand-up reputation to help fend off some of the critics. It was this new ownership that financed the building of a new grandstand with its distinctive twin spires, which was completed in 1895. This was larger. It once again had separate seating for ladies to maintain some distance between them and the betting stand, and it faced a different direction from the previous structure so that people watching the race didn't also have the afternoon sun shining in their eyes. That's nice. Nobody wants to stare into a glare. I really don't. I hate it. (laughs) I super hate it. Uh, Responding to complaints from the horse's owners and trainers, the new derby management also built new stables and in 1896 shortened the race's length by a quarter of a mile. That was also the first year that the winning horse, Ben Brush, was draped in a garland of roses, although they were pink and white rather than the red that is normally used today. The red rose garland tradition started in 1932 with winner Burgu King. In spite of, or perhaps because of, their extensive connections to gambling and bookmaking, the Kentucky Derby really started to turn around financially under this new ownership. But in 1899, Clark, who had been diagnosed with what was called then melancholia, died by suicide. Apart from the personal tragedy, this meant that the Kentucky Derby lost its founder, its chief promoter, and its most tireless advocate— He was also the person who had set the stage for it to become such a social and sporting spectacle. Three years later, in 1902, the Derby once again changed hands, this time moving away from bookies and back to people who were prominent parts of Louisville society. This included the mayor, Charles Granger, and Martin J. Matt Wynn, who was better known as Colonel Wynn. And it was Wynn who took up the mantle of the Derby's public face and the person who really shaped the standard for the Derby's reputation and tone. He, to be clear, was not a military colonel. There's apparently a tradition in Kentucky of giving people colonel as kind of an honorary title. (laughs) The prior... The prior upgrade to the grandstand hadn't touched the original clubhouse, which had previously been the place for the Derby's most exclusive and affluent spectators to gather and socialize. Really, the new grandstand had made that old clubhouse basically inaccessible because the gambling-focused ownership was a lot more into making it easier to gamble than to provide a luxurious vantage point for the most rich patrons. 
When Granger and the rest of the third generation of Derby owners reversed that position, they opened a new clubhouse in 1903. And today, the clubhouse is really a whole complex of buildings, includes, including the exclusive Millionaire's Row. And Wynn, who had a larger-than-life personality, poured himself into refining the Kentucky Derby's image, which was in some ways patterned after his own. Together, Wynn and the Derby spun out a narrative that the place and the event were deeply and innately Southern, and specifically Kentuckian, and rich with both culture and bourbon. It threw back to a romanticized ideal of the Old South, as a genteel place where people of refinement and taste looked out from their verandas over green lawns and rolling rolling hills, sipping mint juleps, which was by then a traditional derby drink made with Kentucky bourbon whiskey. At the same time, this refinement of the derby's public image was also shifting the rest of the nation's perception of the Commonwealth of Kentucky as a whole. In many parts of the nation, Kentucky had long had a reputation as being mostly a very lawless, violent, and unrefined place full of hillbillies, particularly in its more mountainous portions This romantic aura of the Kentucky Derby started to shift that stereotype to make it also a place that could be home to a prestigious, fashionable annual event that that catered to the rich and famous and the working class alike. Aside from his own personal influence on the Derby, Colonel Wynn also made a series of astute decisions that helped bring the Derby more prestige and good press. He convinced wealthy and prominent owners to enter their horses. And one of these was a filly named Regret, who became the first filly to win the Derby in 1915, which attracted a huge amount of press. Wynn was also one of the first proponents of conceiving of the Derby and two other races, the Preakness and the Belmont, as a set of races, which are known today as the Triple Crown. The first horse to win all three of these races was Sir Barton in 1919, although the term Triple Crown wasn't officially coined until 1930. By the 1930s, all the things people most readily associate with the Kentucky Derby, the hats, the roses, the juleps, the atmosphere, were solidly part of the annual event. It's not clear when the 1853 Stephen Foster song, My Old Kentucky Home, became a derby staple, but it was definitely in use by 1921. And the slogan, Run for the Roses, was coined by sports columnist Bill Corum in 1925, the same year the derby was broadcast on network radio for the first time. By the 30s, you could buy a souvenir glass for your mint julep, an innovation in part in the hope that people would stop stealing the drinkware. At the same time, the Kentucky Derby looks very much different today than it did in its first 50 years, and we're going to talk about how after another quick sponsor break. At various points during its history, which really add up to basically all of its history, the Kentucky Derby has been criticized for a whole range of issues. In addition to the campaigns to end gambling and drinking and racing that we already discussed, in more recent years, the Derby has faced allegations of animal abuses, both during training and in the race itself. This has been especially true after accidents and injuries have happened during or after the race. In 2008, for example, Philly Eight Bells collapsed after the race, having broken both of her front ankles and she had to be euthanized. Although women were specifically invited to attend the Kentucky Derby from the very beginning with separate seating away from the betting falling out of favor in the years after World War I, the Derby has, in a lot of ways, always been a man's world. Diane Crump was the first woman to ride in the Derby in 1970, and she's one of only six women jockeys in the Kentucky Derby as of 2016. Women have been involved in other roles at the Kentucky Derby further back in history. In 1905, Elwood took the prize and was the first Kentucky Derby winner owned by a woman, Laska Durnell. Elwood was also the first Derby winner bred by a woman who is cited everywhere as Mrs. J.B. Prather. i don't know what her actual uh, first name is. But as of 2016, no woman trainer or jockey had ever won the Kentucky Derby, and men outnumber women by far in all of these roles. 
So today, men, and in particular white men, dominate the Kentucky Derby scene, all the way from most of the Churchill Downs Incorporated Board of Directors to the jockeys riding in the race. But that wasn't the case when the Derby started. Although Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr. and his associates and investors were white, the majority of the jockeys and trainers were not. In 1875, 13 out of the Derby's 15 jockeys in that first race were Black, as were many of the trainers. When the Kentucky Derby began, the people who had the most experience caring for and training horses, particularly in the South, were Black. And since the first Derby took place only about a decade after the Civil War and the ratification of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, and Kentucky had been a slave state, Many of the men who had trained and cared for and rode in the first Kentucky Derby were either previously enslaved or were the children of people who had been enslaved. In that first 1875 Kentucky Derby, the winning horse was Aristides, who set a record for speed in three-year-old horses. Aristides' trainer, Ansel Williamson, and his jockey, 19-year-old Oliver Lewis, were both black. Williamson was enslaved from birth and sold from one owner to another until being emancipated following the Civil War. Between that first derby in 1902, when Jimmy Winkfield rode Alan Adale to the win, which was Winkfield's second consecutive win, 15 of the 28 winning horses were ridden by black jockeys. In those years, between Oliver Lewis and Jimmy Winkfield, other black jockeys rose to prominence at the Derby and eventually became the era's version of the sports superstar. Isaac Burns Murphy was the first jockey to win the Derby three times, which he did in 1884, 1890, and 1891. He became a colossally well-respected jockey, winning 44% of the races he rode in, which is a record no other jockey has topped. The post-Civil War Reconstruction officially ended in 1876, the year after the first Kentucky Derby. Racist Jim Crow laws enforcing segregation soon followed. In 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Plessy v. Ferguson that this segregation was legal as long as the separate facilities were equal. And by that point, a lot of other sports had already implemented their own systems of segregation. However, it was not possible to quickly segregate the sport of horse racing when so much of the knowledge of how to care for a horse and ride it to a win rested with Black people. As long as training and riding a horse had been regarded as labor and not as a job that could turn someone into a celebrity, it hadn't mattered as much to the white racing community to do anything about it. But when Black jockeys started to become famous for their work and respected for it, that success became a threat. For a while, the mythology of the Kentucky Derby maintained that the shift to primarily white trainers and jockeys had been a, quote, natural one, that all the old jockeys and trainers had moved north during the Great Migration, which began in the 19-teens, or that the Black men had lost their taste of agricultural work and had gone to work in factories instead. But this was absolutely untrue. By the late 1880s and early 1890s, the white racing community was making a dedicated and deliberate effort to force black jockeys and trainers out of the industry. Black jockeys started experiencing harassment both on and off the track, with white jockeys forcing them into the rails during the race or actually striking them with their horse whips. This last one was not only physically painful, but was also humiliating because it harkened back to whips being used to punish slaves. By the turn of the 20th century, Black jockeys were having trouble finding contracts to ride horses, and Black trainers were finding themselves out of work, with owners seeking out white jockeys and trainers. The tracks played their part as well, with many explicitly banning Black jockeys by 1904. So it was under intentional systemic racism that Black jockeys were forced out of the Kentucky Derby and of the racing industry in general. There were no black jockeys at all in the Kentucky Derby between 1921 and 2000. That year, Marlon St. Julian rode and placed seventh. It would be more than another decade after he rode that the Derby would see another black jockey, and that was Kevin Krieger, who was originally from St. Croix, who rolled Golden Sense in the 2013 Derby. 
All of this, of course, complicates the Kentucky Derby's romanticized presentation of life in the South. It's a lot of the same tropes that are used to romanticize plantations and antebellum life, which, while it looks very romantic on the surface, when you really take a gander at it, it's very problematic. Yes, the the, the even the term plantation comes with this aura of, like, beautiful magnolia trees and sipping sweet tea on your, yeah. on your front porch. Uh, but it was effectively a slave labor camp, so <laughs> which does not have that same romanticized idea. So no. um, there are definitely parallels between the overall narrative that tries to, like, shift the perception of what slave states in the South were like and the perception of what... Uh, the Kentucky Derby is was like and why there was such a shift in the demographics of who was training and riding and taking care of the horses. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 